Well, good afternoon and welcome to you all to this session with a fantastic line out uh, of satirical satirists to talk about the art of satire. Uh, my name is Rachel Holmes. I'm your moderator this afternoon uh, and I'm a great admirer of this form. It is one of my, my favourite forms in both uh, fiction and non-fiction. To introduce our illustrious panel, I have to my far left, which is my favourite place, Ned Bowman. Uh, I have uh, to, in the middle, Ashok Ferry and I have Mohammed Hanif to my right. And all of them can be introduced individually, but I'm going to introduce them collectively because they have several things in common. They are all very talented novelists, and they are all very talented journalists who write in a variety and have written in a variety of, of different uh, magazines, newspapers, and journals internationally. What I'm going to do is, because they have all these distinctions in common, their novels and their journalism, and an embarrassment of awards and various other prizes and that sort of things between them, I'm actually going to focus on something in my introduction which I think is actually quite relevant to satire, and that is where they come from. Because I think where we come from and where we grow up and what our environments are might be something that influence our attitude to this form. Um, Ned is a man of mystery. He's probably the most mysterious person on this panel because he was born in London in the mid-80s. And I asked him for the, for the most curious and strangest thing that he'd ever done that I could talk about in public. And he went very, very quiet. And he said, I have never done any interesting jobs. <laughs> which I think is tantalizing. So we might want to interrogate that a little bit more. Um, but he's also uh, has the distinction of being one of our young British uh, grant novelists of the, of the last, uh, the last uh, uh, batch of 2013. So please welcome Ned Bowman. Thanks. Mohammed Hanif, immediately here to my right, I'm sure he's uh, left, I'm sure he's known to, uh, to many of you, is a, a Pakistani and Londoner. He's lived between the two places. Uh, and as well as being an acclaimed journalist and, uh, and writer, novelist, um, he also grew up in Akara, which I am reliably informed by my local friends will give anybody a sense of humor to survive. So perhaps you will tell us a little bit more about that. But the other thing which I really like, because it sounds, it sounds so mash, it sounds so sort of I don't know, catch 22, is that uh, he was in the Pakistan Air Force Academy. And I infinitely regret the fact that you have not brought your, your uniform, which I hope you had to wear at some time uh, today. He also worked for a long time for the BBC World Service in London. And then Ashok Ferry in, in the middle uh, grew up in uh, Somalia and Nigeria. So in, in East Africa and, and West Africa. And uh, his distinction, as, as well as having now published four novels um, and, uh, and volumes of short stories, is that when he was a builder in London in the 1980s, he converted no less than 84 Victorian houses uh, into, a, uh, into flats in Brixton, um, which must have kept you quite busy. But he returned to Sri Lanka in 1988. So welcome, Ashok and Mohammed Hanif. I want to kick off by asking you each, each in turn, um, really, why satire? Why, why this particular form appeals to you? Or whether indeed you actually consciously think about yourselves as, as, satir as, as writers of, of satire? And I'm going to come to you first. Ashok. Um, can you hear me? Ah, that's better. Uh, in, in my case, I, I came to writing quite late in life, and I just wrote. And it's only when, when the book was published that people said, oh gosh, it's funny, it's funny, or whatever. And th it's only then that I realized that the writing had a certain kind of bite to it, which I wasn't aware of. So to answer your question, um, I don't consider myself a satirist, or I, at least I didn't. I'm now sort of having to acknowledge the fact that perhaps it is, my writing is satirical. 
Okay. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. You say you came to writing late in life. Could you just give us a bit more context on, on that journey? Um, well, I read pure mathematics at Oxford, so I should have been... That's funny. Um, uh, well, there you are. That's funny. <laughs> so I should have been an actuary, which is, which is a person who works for insurance companies, gets paid lots of money, but it's a really boring job. Uh, and I interned in an insurance company for three months, uh, one summer holidays, and then I thought, that's not for me. And then I left Oxford and I didn't have a visa, so I ended up working on building sites. And I ended up kind of uh, sort of owning the building sites bit by bit. And then I did these 84 flats. To cut a long story short, I came back to Sri Lanka and my father got cancer. And then I started writing as a way of relieving stress. So I really didn't expect the stuff to be funny because it actually began when I was quite sad, when my father was dying. Um, so, so that's that's the story of my life. Hanif. Mm, yeah, I don't... Uh... Yeah, does this thing work? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't consider myself a satirist. I think I'm a proper writer. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mm, but uh, but I guess he's right. I think that's probably one of our dirty secrets. So sometimes we think that we're writing serious stuff and people read it and they oh, that was funny. I said, oh, actually. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I guess uh, he, I think uh, uh, he mentioned something that his, his father had cancer and was going through a lot of stress and bad times. And uh, we kind of, uh, I think since I've grown up, we've been going through a lot of stress as a nation. Uh, so I think you kind of start making uh, jokes uh, after a while because that's just about the only way uh, you can, you know, sort of uh, go to sleep uh, uh, at night. So, and also I think going beyond that, uh, I've just begun to realize that, uh, that uh, Pakistanis and Punjabis especially, uh, being one myself, I think they have this bad addiction to jokes. Uh, they kind of are always, you go around small towns in Punjab, men will be sitting on a street corner, and what will they be doing? They'll be making jokes out of, like, you know, sort of the, the village elder, the Nawaz Sharif, Mamalvi Saab, whatever, uh, even if there's a problem, you know, sort of with the crops, it will somehow express itself in a in a sort of long winded joke and you'll be waiting, is there a punchline or not? Or is this, uh, am I just kind of uh, stuck in this bad joke that uh, kind of keeps repeating itself? So I think, yeah, we have this uh, special uh, uh, talent uh, for, for example, these days, uh, all our TV, news TV, uh, I think their main offering uh, is kind of, you know, these, uh, these comedy hysterical type programs. And I'm not like even talking about their proper serious talk shows. They're also funny, but they have then other shows which make fun of these shows. So there's like this kind of endless joke that goes on. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So you can't escape it, basically. Mm. Ned, do you uh, do you share with the other two the sense that you you know you, you set out and you're writing a book, it's a novel, and then the tone or the style comes in later? I mean, what or do you feel that you have a particular relationship to? to satire as a genre? Um, well, I'd make a slightly Jesuitical distinction between satire, parody, and pastiche in this case. So in my first two books, which were mostly set in the 1930s and 40s, uh, there were stretches in which I imitated, for instance, um, some obscure British eugenics theorist of the 1930s or some obscure German expressionist theatre director of the 1930s. And in both cases, I don't know if those things can really qualify as satire because um, when you're getting into something that is already so much in the past and that none of your readers would ever even have heard of if you hadn't chosen to put it in the book, then I don't know whether or not that counts as satire. For me, satire has an overtone of sort of contemporaneity and aggression and having a real point to make instead of just often in my case why I mentioned pastiche is because it's much more to do with having fun with language and um, trying to find jokes 
inside the exaggerations or sort of contradictions of someone's style or their way of thinking about things. That alone for me is not satire. It has to be, for me, it has to be, you've got to be, in a sense, punching something which can punch back for it to be satire, which is why my third novel, Glow, which came out a few years ago, that's the first one I've written that's set in the present day. And in that one, I think I did shade into um, satire of for instance, the way uh, the language of the modern military in one direction kind of fades into the language of marketing sometimes and in another direction fades into the language of a web 2.0 startup. So there's a bit of material of that kind. But even then, uh, when I set out to write the book, I didn't have really a big point to make about uh, the sort of military industrial complex of 2010. It was much more that I came across this material, found something funny about it, and then imitated it for a few pages, which could just as well have happened with something I came across from Victorian times or indeed sort of Sumerian times, and, and then it's back to parody. So in that sense, I don't think I fully qualify as a satirist, even if there have been flashes of satire-like material in some of my recent work. <laughs> Let's come back to um, the question of, of, of actually politics and also where, where, the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where humour comes from, because that's sort of like a sort of broader uh, approach, isn't it? And Ashok, I mean, you know, with a, like your, your most recent novel, uh, Serendipity, with a sort of, it's a sort of the lightness of Woodhouse, but, but actually is writing about civil war. And, uh, and, and diaspora to, to some extent. So, I mean, say, say a bit more about, about that, because in, in that novel, you're, you're, really ta you know, you're really getting to the heart of some of the key issues of what's happened in, you know, what happened in that civil war and that politics and those differences. But, but as I say, with that lightness of touch. Um, I, I come from Sri Lanka, and we've had a 27-year civil war, which, is, which was so complex that no one person understood it all. There were so many moving parts to it. And I, 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 for one, really did not think I could do it justice. It, was, it is not something, even today, people will disagree on what happened to who and where. Everybody has a different side to this very, very complex war. So um, I think I wrote this uh, novel, Serendipity, in the last three months when the war was coming to a very, very bloody conclusion. And I was wrong. I actually thought it was that, that it was a war that could never be won. And in fact, I was wrong. It was won, and won very comprehensively by one side. Um, but I started writing the novel. I mean, it's it's. I think the funniest novel I've written, but it's also the most shrill and hysterical. And it was my way of coming to terms with all these deaths and these bombs. The opening page has somebody's thumb flying over a garden wall and landing in, in uh, uh, somebody else's okra plant, ladies' fingers, you know, so she plucks her ladies' fingers and there's a thumb in her, in her basket. Now, you will laugh at that, but actually that happened to me. There was somebody's thumb in my garden because there was a bomb. The road I lived on had three major bombs, one of which uh, 64 people died, and this thumb appeared in my garden. So, so um, uh, Sri Lanka is like that even today. We've had two years of peace, but it's very, very surreal, the whole thing. Things that happen in Sri Lanka don't, you know, you, you, you write it as plain nonfiction. It is still funny. It, 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 it has that kind of thing, and, and perhaps, perhaps that novel was my way of trying to come to terms with it. So there are lots and lots of characters, five, six major characters, and they all lead very frenzied. They somehow tie up, I hope they tie up, but, but they all lead quite distinctly separate, funny, funny sort of existences. Uh, and it was just my way of coming to terms with, with all that violence. So in some sense, what you're all negotiating is, is the sense in which Truth is stranger than fiction in some sense. I mean, Hanif, you were saying about, you know, about uh, chat shows, reality shows. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, 
it is some days it's uh, obviously stranger uh, than fiction and and some days uh, it's uh, it's just sad and then you kind of you know live in that cycle for long enough and then mm, and then when you look around uh, you sometimes don't even have to write satire it's writing itself uh, for you uh, those of you who have been in the earliest session i've been said it this before uh, so i'll say it again that uh, here in the city we have a government right which says that uh, for this festival they said that oh mm, we can't give you security well fine there are lots of other precious places in pakistan other people who needs protection but then the government says we can't give you security on friday but we can give it to you on saturday and sunday <laughs> like there's a security threat to this festival and that's uh, but that's not and then they say that we can't give it to you in a public place which is like right across the uh, road uh, that there's a security threat in the city apparently uh, but it doesn't ex- reach here but it can reach like uh, across the road so i i i don't know like uh, you don't really uh, uh, need to add anything or take anything away from it you just need to uh, uh, read your kind of you know rulers uh, uh, lips and what they say and uh, sometimes it is actually uh, quite funny you can't stop laughing mm. 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 Ned, com- coming back to you on this question of, of of politics and i guess some sense of sort of speaking truth to power i mean you you mentioned about having uh, in your earlier novels before getting more contemporary and glow uh, looking at you know working with stuff from the sort of 1930s but one of the things that strikes me at the moment is certainly in certain britain and certain parts of western europe we're in quite a 1930s like so there there are a lot of reminiscences of stuff that 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 is happening economically socially uh, in terms of racism in terms of migrancy uh, and specifically actually in terms of freedom of expression which does seem to be a common theme this you know the other part of the the title of this chat this riff was around satire as self defense and i wanted to just try and I'm not quite sure what that self-defense thing means. I don't know whether it means like jujitsu, um, or well, actually, what does it mean? Can you explain to me? I mean, you're the guys that do it. So, what, what does satire as self-defense mean? I think the simple thing is that you say something, and if somebody gets offended, you say, "Oh, I was just joking." I guess that's <laughs> that's, that's the only. I think that's the only kind of uh, thing. I, no. I think he nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, we're sort of we in Sri Lanka work on the uh, the, the rule that politicians r- don't read books. So whatever you write there, you're fairly safe. Of course, somebody else who does read the book might phone the politician and say, "Hey, Chum, you're in the book," but uh, it, it gives you safety at one remove, sort of thing. It's fiction. Mm-hmm. It's fiction. It's not true. Okay. Uh, um, I mean, I write in the UK, so I'm not in any danger i mean <laughs> <laughs> that's what you I think i was about to say i was i'm not in any danger of um th- threat from politicians i did uh michael gove who at the time was the minister of education for the conservative government in the uk did say that i was um something like britain's best young novelist and his government is so repugnant that to have him say i was britain's best young novelist Ned, i'm so sorry <laughs> yeah i know was actually probably more damaging to <laughs> me and my future than any form of deliberate repression by an authoritarian government this is a man who so wants to burn sense, folks <laughs> in that sense i am in danger from my country's government but <laughs> failing that i can write in relative freedom so i'm in the um a much more sort of decadent position of the only thing i have to worry about in terms of offending people is that it might then make me unpopular on twitter and on books blogs and it might hurt my sales that's that's the worst thing that can happen really but even then i think satire as self defense does work in the same way we've just been discussing in the se- in the w- sense that um if you write a book in which is visibly sort of weaving around various different levels of irony then um it does um 
people are afraid to attribute any particular position to you because they worry they'll look stupid for taking seriously something in your book that it will turn out they weren't meant to take seriously. So there are lots of things, yes, that I can say in my books that would make me unpopular if I said them as Ned Bowman, but on the page it's fine. Talk about um, being in, in Britain, and we, and we talked a little bit about the context out of which you're all now writing. But I just wonder, um, and this is a question for all of you, seeing as that you have you know, diverse and, and, and migrant and bifurcated upbringings and lives that you've you know, born in one place and lived in others and moved around. To what extent do you think that you know, those, I kind of literally mean the childhood and the early life experiences actually shape how your, your attitudes to, towards these questions? I, honestly, I don't think it has made that much difference. I, I think you, you're born with this kind of edge to you, and you, you know, in other words, you're a satirist if you write in a certain way. I, I am not sure that you can become a satirist. Do you know what I mean? So, so I think living in different places, which all of us have that experience, I don't think that really uh, has had any influence on the writing. Mm -hmm. It makes it more exotic, perhaps. But uh, it, I, I, I'm not sure it makes it satirical. Mm. Yeah, no, I think more than real world, uh, sometimes we kind of don't talk about it. The writers kind of read, tend to, I mean, most writers I know, they, they tend to read a lot. And uh, so they inhabit another world, which is uh, the, the sort of world of books. So their kind of minds are full of all these stories uh, that uh, they've read. Uh, so I think more than life or living here or living in London, I think w what has influenced me, I would say, is all the books uh, that I've read. And those I could have read in Karachi, I could have read in Nukara, I could have read in, in, in London. Uh, so I, I think my kind of influences are more from books. So I, it must have, I must have loved, I must have laughed at all the, all the kind of funny things that I, I read. And I've, you kind of one day you start to copy them. I guess that's how that's how I started in writing. So, uh. who Ned? I suppose one way in which that's um, my upbringing has influenced me is that so I grew up in the middle class south of England, and then I went to a very old public school called Winchester, and then I went to Cambridge, which in the 19th century would have been a kind of archetypal track to then become some kind of colonial administrator and come to this part of the world and possibly commit some kind of atrocity for which you would never have to face any consequences. And then nowadays, that's an archetypal track to go into investment banking or derivatives <laughs> and maybe go to Hong Kong and commit not an atrocity, but something that is in the long run, I don't know, going to cause poverty or instability for a number of people. So realizing that um, the kinds of people from Britain that for the last 100 years or so have often been the most sort of worthy of satire and contempt, realizing that they in many ways talk and think like me and have many of the same experiences as me and many of the same reference points. I think that has really gone into my fiction, that understanding that there's such a kind of sliver of a gap between me and some junior viceroy or me and some derivatives broker. Um, I only have to hop along a little bit to try and inhabit that kind of mind. So you will find characters like that in all of my books. Ashok, for you, your reading influences, I mean, particularly given that you, you know, fabulously were sort of able to come to a writing career uh, later in your various lives, but until you did, I mean, what were your, what were your key reading influences? Um, I can honestly say that while I was a builder, between the ages of 20 and... 32, I didn't read a single book. Uh, before that, I was a mathematician, so I didn't read much either. <laughs> 
sadly. Mm. I mean, math, math is a language of its own and, and it's a very beautiful language, but it's not, it ain't English. <laughs> uh, so uh, having said that, I, I always love to read. Um, I mean, when I was young anyway. And the influences, I don't know, all those kind of mid-century British humorists who really, to me, are absolutely the tops. You know, you have Evelyn Waugh or Graham Greene or Muriel Spark or Woodhouse, as you mentioned, um, Wild earlier on. I mean, amazing stuff that actually nobody has equaled since. Really, they haven't. I mean, the humor has changed. There are different humorists now. To my mind, they're simply not as funny. Because humor is one of those things that you have to work really, really hard. I, I don't know if my fellow panelists will agree, but one word out of place in the sentence and you've lost the joke. You know, it's, it's really, you have to have an extremely fine ear to, to, to pick up the, the joke or, or not be able to kill the joke with, with, with a bad sentence. I, I don't know whether you'd, you'd agree with that, but um, that's, that's my experience. Uh position on the page. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. In fact, all along I'm thinking, surely there was way more money in construction than there is in books. Why did you... You're looking at a fool here. You're looking at a bloody fool here. Fool here. <laughs> Absolutely true. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess before, because I'd like to uh, open up the questions from the floor in a discussion while we still have time. Um, but before we do that, so please be thinking about your, your opening questions. But on that question of, the, of or that point that you make, Ashok, about the word having to be in the right place for the joke, um, I'm thinking about persisting with the form of writing. I mean, whether it's in your fiction or it's in your journalism. Uh, in an age where so much can be done in film and and TV. So, I mean, I know, Ned, you, you wrote somewhere that a really nice way to in, in encounter uh, a novel that you've read before is to sort of see it reenacted on stage. Was, or, was, or maybe that was you, actually. Was that in one of your blogs? Or was it you that said um, that uh, to... If you were reading a novel, that, if you hadn't read a novel for a while, but you were re-encountering it, a nice way to do it is to see it acted out on stage in in 12 different parts. I, it was definitely one of you. I, and you, you. No? no. Well, huh? <laughs> might have been me, I don't know. I, no, I really didn't make that up, I'll have to check. Anyway, <laughs> Hanif, maybe it was you. Um, but, but seriously, just um, that question of, of why the written form, when there is, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sort of putting aside live theatre and drama, but in where there is so much that can be done brilliantly in, in film, you know, whether it's big narrative movies, whether it's TV, and particularly around irony, satire, comedy, speaking truth to power. Why this will to, for the print, for the, for the for want of a better way of putting it, the written word? Well, I, I think, um, I, I could be completely wrong here, but, but I think writing is, um, in, in, uh, on television or cinema, you can make something very funny, but it's just on the one dimension. In books with words, you can be funny with three different levels of funniness. There can be a sort of slapstick, there can be the beauty of, or the cleverness of how you use the words. And, and um, in a lot of my writing, uh, there are singular puns in the English, which no English audience will ever pick up. Uh, and no singular audience probably will read the book because they won't know English. But it doesn't matter, I'm happy. <laughs> uh, uh, really, it's like yeah. that. You can be very, very complex in, 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 with your words in a way that you can't be with cinema. It's, it's, cinema is a very one-dimensional um, creature. So it's allowing you lots of different registers. Ned? Um, well, the first thing I'd say is I only half agree with that in the sense that I feel like our standards for comedy in books are often much lower than our standards for comedy in film or TV. So um, for a really good comedy film or especially TV series, we expect to be really laughing painfully hard. Whereas a literary novel, if you sort of half smile at it, then the reviewer will say this hilarious and <laughs> coruscating. I think a lot of the sort of top sitcom writers at the moment, if they were writing fiction and were equally funny, people would just be stunned by how much better it is than 
or, or at least in terms of the construction of the jokes. So one example is um, one of my favourite TV series in the UK is called Peep Show, and the, one of the writers of that, Jesse Armstrong, did just publish his first novel, which is a really excellent satirical novel called Love, Sex, and Other Foreign Policy Goals about the siege of Sarajevo. And uh, it's almost sort of jarring how genuinely funny it is because he's a TV writer compared to what we think of as comic or satirical novels, which are sort of very gently funny most of the time. Um, that said, well, first of all, I actually do do a bit of screenwriting, so I don't entirely want to limit myself to prose. One of the reasons I do is um, that there are things you can do in a novel, of course, that you couldn't do in a film, just in terms of sort of the shape and the grandeur and, you know, you can have, as it were, an enormous stage set and it only has to be built for one scene. Um, but also, comedy writing for TV and film is so much a science. You have it's all it's like being an athlete or something. You have to be so good, so trained for life. And I wouldn't be nearly good enough for the reasons that I was just explaining. Whereas. I find it much less daunting to write a literary novel um, where the number one aim is not to make people laugh. The number one aim is to um, propel a plot and sort of play some games with ideas and meaning and so on and then hopefully have some jokes along the way. But if there's a long stretch where there are no jokes or most of the jokes fail, no one will really notice or complain. Whereas, of course, if you were writing comedy for TV or film, if you have a long stretch with no loss, then that's unacceptable. So uh, I actually prefer not to have that pressure because a novel can both be more things and it doesn't have to be so much of one thing, I find. Hmm. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't think really think about that I've also done uh, sort of a, a bit of screenwriting a bit of stage uh, plays type things uh, I think uh, the problem with all these genres is that you have to work with other people mm. who are mostly horrible mm. uh, especially who work like in show business type or, mm. or stage kind of they're just angst ridden uh, they're kind of uh, and you are angst ridden as well so so I writing books in a way kind of gives you that it's all your own, there's your notebook, there's your laptop, there's your pen. You don't have to kind of, you know, uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, any other people. And I think some writers are a bit of loners. They like being by themselves and they like disappearing into their study and say that, oh, oh I'm writing my novel and people are supposed to believe you year after year after year. <laughs> uh, uh, so it comes, it has, uh, it, it has uh, sort of fewer, I guess, uh, audience like fewer people read books than watch TV obviously uh, but it obviously it has uh, its uh, its advantages yeah. <laughs> thank you mm. well thank you all and I'm now going to uh, open up to questions from the floor do we have some roving mics we do okay so we'll start with that uh, lady there and then the woman behind her as well please thank you very much uh, quick question I I'm a first statement. Um, I write columns and sometimes I try to be funny and uh, satirical uh, or it just happens to be and then I get serious questions on it and I absolutely hate it that nobody got the satire and I've seen it happening to other people. Is there something, um, have you guys come across that when you've read said something tongue in the cheek and people thought you were serious and then how do you explain it when you get questions on it i've seen it happen to say for example um we have fasi zaka we have uh, nfp from karachi uh, he recently did something it got taken so seriously has it happened to any of you yeah it, it's gone it, it happens all the time Sadly, um, I don't know what it is about us South Asians, you know, uh, but, but the thing is, don't explain. Because the moment you explain, you lose the joke anyway. <laughs> it's best not to have it. 
Uh, and so, so, you know, that's my policy. I just never defend myself when somebody takes it seriously. <laughs> uh, uh. Uh, I. I um. I find, yeah, I find that the internet is very bad for this because um, anything can be quoted out of context and anything out of context looks like an absolutely sincere sort of statement of position or, you know, manifesto. Um, so it's, uh, as I mentioned before, if you... Um, I find that if I put something within the covers of fiction, then people automatically mistrust it. And also, I think for the simple reason that it's in a book, it's harder to then copy and paste it into a tweet, so people <laughs> don't take it out of context as much. Whereas, if you say something in a column or in an interview, it's so easy to copy and paste, and then as soon as it's copy and pasted, everyone will think you meant it 100% and then react furiously um, as if that's the n number one message that you're trying to broadcast to the world and it must be defended against. <laughs> um, which is one of the reasons that I uh, try and avoid the internet for the most part. But yeah, it is a shame that in my fiction I really do try and play with irony and operate at multiple levels of irony at all times, but anything that's under my own name, you have to be, in the most banal way, basically just make declarative statements of empirical facts, <laughs> otherwise you will get in trouble when someone puts it in a tweet. How did worst case scenario have been taken seriously when you weren't intending to be? With me? Mm. Uh, no, I mean, not really. I think, yeah, sometimes do people, uh, my first book is a work of fiction, but a lot of uh, people think that actually it's history, which is uh, kind of bizarre. But Yeah, but I yeah, heard yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, strange, yeah, so yeah, strange. Uh, I met yeah. some of those people. Yeah. Yeah, mm. <laughs> they're very close to me right now. Mm. Now, uh, so there was another question, I think, behind. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so the question, I mean, being you as a can't hear you. You can't hear me? Can? Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, all three of you being satirists, so I think this is the best, you are the best people to ask this question from. Uh, when you write satire, is it that you come from this position of superiority, uh, where you know that you know this idea that this uh, superficial is, is based upon, where you can actually poke the bull and you know, you still have that defense there and not get attacked in return, or is it is it genuinely defending not from rather from your own self? In, uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Not really. Hello. Another. Okay, so the. Hello. Should I repeat the question? All right. Uh, so when you write satire, is it that you write from this position of superiority where rest of the people are so dumb with it, they're never going to get the basic idea where the superficial humor is stemming from? Or is it defending your own self from the pain uh, that you're too afraid will explode unless you crack a joke on it? You know, the ideas that are based upon, uh, especially from Muhammad uh, Hanif, who, who is actually writing from this uh, subcontinental religious or political point of view. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think that's a very good question because you are writing from a position of superiority, sadly, and you have to do your best not to appear to be so because a satirist is poking fun at other people and it kind of puts you in this position of, ah, look at me, I'm fine and you're not and this is, you're the dumb ass and I'm making these jokes about you. So how, how, do you, how do you get around that? And I think the way you get around that is with self-deprecation. You have to bring in jokes against yourself somehow in the middle of that. That's the only, the, the only way you can. 
Uh, what was the other part of that question, which is also quite good? I've, I've uh, basically forgotten what you said. Are, are you sort of protecting your own vulnerability, or are you protecting your own vulnerabilities? Yes. Um, also that, very much that. Uh, I think the other side of satire is absolute suffering mm. because you are so damaged by what you see around you that this is the only way you can hit out. Mm. Um, I think there is very much uh, that, that, part, that element in satire mm. also, that you are really suffering, you're really hurting. That's why you hit out. Uh. Um, I, for me, it depends what you mean by superiority, because I, I feel like satire always comes from a position of impotence, in the sense that if you had any real power, you would be <laughs> exerting it in the world and changing things. Um, the fact that you've been reduced to writing about it and making jokes about it is an immediate proof that <laughs> everything's going past you <laughs> and there's no way for you to intervene. So I think it almost doesn't matter how sort of arrogantly or haughtily <laughs> or superciliously you, your tone is because everyone knows from the beginning that you're just sort of tapping completely ineffectually at something much bigger and more important than you. So, I mean, unless you are satirizing some vulnerable and downtrodden group, which hopefully none of us do, but on the whole, um, one is satirizing people who are actually in the world doing things, and the satire is a sort of relatively small person writing for quite a small audience of people who already agree with him or her to no effect. So I, I don't worry that anyone's going to think I'm sort of overweening by trying to be superior to whatever I'm satirizing because that superiority is so hollow essentially. <laughs> Hanif, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, no, I actually never thought about it. But uh, but yeah, it's an act of helplessness mostly. Mm. And just, just imagine like a grown-up man sitting on a desk in a corner trying to make a joke. I how sad, how sad uh, uh, that uh, looks and sounds and mostly uh, uh, is. But, uh, but yeah, sometimes uh, mm, we do come across as uh, superiors because, and I think then, uh, as he says that we should be, we should be kind of, uh, uh, we should think about that. And uh, so that's why a lot of, uh, nobody wants to be seen as a pompous ass. I mean, let's uh, admit it. You want to be seen as like this nice uh, uh, guy. So a lot of work goes into kind of pretending that, look, I'm just like you. I'm not. Uh, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one final question to these nice guys. Who's it going to be? I've had some from the side of the floor. Does anybody from over here? At the back there, did you have your hand up right there? No? <coughs> okay, we'll take your question here then, thank you. Oh, no, he's here. Only the side of the house is asking questions for some reason. So basically I have two questions. Uh, firstly, uh, where do you draw... Th it is, okay, so I have two questions. Firstly, where do you draw the line between satire, humor, versus uh, jokes that might be provocative or borderline racist or things like that. And so the second question is, do you even draw the distinction or not? Or is it important or not? Okay, so is there such a thing as a fence, gentlemen? Yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, <laughs> Ned? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think there is such a thing as offence. I question whether there is such a thing as a right to not be offended, which, which <laughs> often seems to be asserted these days. But um, unless the offence is piled atop um, a series of much more kind of serious injuries that the world is doing to you, I don't think offence in itself uh, can be counted as a real harm, or at least when that's weighed morally in the balance with other potential harms relating to censorship or 
the failure of expression, I, to me, it, it weighs pretty light. I think those are exemplary answers for three uh, clearly masters of their form. So I'm sure you'll want to join with me uh, in thanking Mohammed Hanif, Ashok Ferry, and Ned Bowman. Thank you very much indeed.